Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Manitoba Agriculture Crop Talk webinar. If you have any questions today, please type them into the Q&A icon located at the bottom toolbar, and we'll answer them at the end of each presentation. This webinar is being recorded, and you will receive a link to the recording. Thank you. Thanks, Lane. Uh, I'd like to uh, welcome everybody to the May 17th edition of Crop Talk. And we're going to do a little bit of a, an update as to along in, in seeding and progress and uh, what's uh, what's kind of happening out in the field, uh, as well as then get into our crop scouting panel. We've actually had quite a few questions come in over the last uh, three to four days here. So I thought it'd be a good opportunity to maybe try to get through all of them before uh, for this session. So there were a lot of good questions that have come in. So uh, we're going to tackle them. So um, I guess with that, uh, start off with a little bit of a, an update. Uh, we were talking before we got going here today that the forecast uh, looks fairly good over the next little while for uh, us to continue seeding and getting the crop in the ground. And when you look at uh, the, the temperatures and uh, forecast for rain over the next little while, I think there might be talking a little bit of rain today, but uh, I think any rain that we do get now, unless it's something uh, uh, on, that's not being called for, wouldn't keep uh, producers out of the field for very long as uh, moisture, uh, the, the ground is starting to dry up a bit and uh, it would uh, definitely soak in fairly fast. Good thing about it is uh, we're not getting overly uh, hot during the day. So uh, it's nice for seeding because you can go in, put uh, open up the ground, get the seed in the ground and uh, not worry about uh, the, the heat uh, drying it right down to uh, to where where you place the seed. And you look at our evenings, even the evenings are getting, staying on the cooler side. So it gives it an opportunity for for. Uh, the soil to cool down a little bit uh, during the day, uh, during the evenings. So uh, where are we as you look at seeding across the province here? Uh, well, we had a very good week of seeding uh, this past week. Uh, I think pretty much every area in the province was able to get out and, and going. Uh, we had a lot of uh, drills moving up and down the, the, the fields and, and up and down the roads getting crop in. So. Uh, uh, a lot of crop got put in this last week. Um, rain in some areas, uh, kind of along the border there, we got uh, a little bit of rain, but again, uh, it was only enough to maybe keep producers out of the field for a day, and uh, there everybody was back up and going again. Seeding conditions, I guess we're, I would almost say we're almost seeding at the perfect uh, conditions right now. Uh, in most areas anyways, uh, it's uh, the soil is uh, moist, it's warm, and uh, we're definitely going to see a quick germination and rapid emergence of the crop. So uh, uh, that'll be something that uh, we'll talk, uh, talk about a little bit more, but I think that's one thing we need to keep uh, an eye on is that crop is not going to, uh, seed is not going to stay a long time in the ground. It's going to germinate and get going. Our winter wheat and fall rye crops are, are jumping right now. This heat is, uh, and moisture they're taking advantage of and, uh, and they're, uh, they're, they're jumping. Uh, fields are covering in fairly good, starting to tiller out very good. And we're seeing uh, some, nice, uh, some nice crops out there. Um, I guess one thing about the winter wheat and fall rye crop, um, I don't uh, see as many of those uh, fields as I have in previous years. So, uh, just from my travels, I would say maybe the the acres are uh, are a little bit down this year than in previous years. But uh, again, there's probably some areas where there's maybe a little bit more than the, more than average. So uh, spring seeding uh, across the province, we sit about 25 percent, and that would be with all crops. Uh, so uh, uh, lower than we normally or we our averages, but uh, still uh, when you consider a week ago we were. Uh, barely, uh, barely getting going, or bare, we were, uh, you know, in the in the area of very low percentages. We we did fairly good in 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 a week's time. Uh, most producers have been putting in cereal crops so far. Uh, I would say a lot of the wheat is getting into the ground, and depending on where you are, uh, you know, it could be as high as fifty percent of of the cereals put in already in your area. 
I have talked to some producers that are actually finishing up on on their cereals already. And uh, again, it's uh, a little bit from where you are and when you got started. And as I mentioned last week, some producers uh, were going uh, probably a week and a half, almost two weeks now. So in those areas, uh, they probably have got the majority of their cereals in. And uh, and those areas are probably the areas that are starting on canola and, uh, and soybeans now. Peas, uh, I guess... Uh, probably one of the ones that is probably the highest amount in right now and uh, climbing every day. So, you know, probably by next week, this time, uh, I would say 100% of the peas would be in right now. We're uh, a good 60% complete. And, uh, you know, like, like I mentioned there, by the end of the week, we could see uh, all the all the peas in the ground. Some canola has been planted. Uh, and, uh, you know, again, as the week goes on and producers start to complete their cereal crops they'll be jumping into canola i don't think there'll be any break uh, i think uh, soil conditions are favorable uh, temp soil temperatures are fair favorable to get that seed in the ground and and get it up and growing fast and uh, and hopefully uh, uh, keep ahead of any flea beetle problems that we might see uh, in in this coming this year uh, there has been uh, the odd producer that i've talked to that is looking at starting to uh, plant soybeans and again, conditions are favorable uh, with the soil moisture and, and the soil temperature for planting them. So probably, uh, you know, not a bad idea. If that's the field that's ready to go next, I probably wouldn't be too uh, afraid of uh, of putting uh, putting in uh, and my soybeans yet. I guess one of the things that I, I was talking to the producer and then uh, I got looking at the weather forecast and then you look at Thursday night, it's uh, clear and going down to three. So we're not out of the woods completely yet for getting into cool temperatures and cool evenings. So uh, uh, always keep that in the back of your mind that, uh, you know, you want to make sure that uh, you're not going to be in a situation where we could be getting scared of a, a, a spring frost uh, that might hurt some crops. So uh, where we're sitting in, uh, in, uh, in seeding compared to previous years, uh, when you look at uh, um, the third week of May. Uh, right now, we're sitting at about 25% complete. Uh, a year ago, uh, only 10% complete. So we're definitely uh, got a good jump on where we were last year at this time. Uh, it's uh, it's nice to see, and uh, and I think again by next week uh, we'll probably see that 25% jump fairly good. Uh, when you look at our five-year average, uh, usually by the third week of May, we're into the mid uh, mid 60s uh, percentages of being completed, and uh, so uh, so we're a little behind our five-year average. But I, as I mentioned, I think by next week we'll be uh, bringing that uh, that difference or that spread a lot closer together. Took these pictures a couple days ago. Uh, you see the early seeded cereals and peas are emerging fairly fast. Uh, wheat on the left hand side here was probably planted about, um, I think I was talking to the producer, he said it's been in the ground for 12 days, I think it was something like that. So up and at it really quick. Uh, he didn't sow very deep, so the crop came up fast, uh, was on uh, uh, fairly uh, as you can see, not a lot of stubble. Uh, so the ground warmed up fast, so the wheat, uh, wheat got going fast. And then a picture of peas coming through the ground and, and breaking the soil surface there. So again, uh, you know, uh, peas are coming up uh, as fast uh, as guys are getting them in. So uh, important, one thing that's important, and I maybe mentioned this a little bit early, earlier about uh, keeping an eye on things. Um, it's important to keep up on the on the spraying uh, to control the early germinating weeds right now too because there's a lot of weeds that are coming up. I think everybody's getting and keeping the drills going, but I think we still need to uh, keep on top of spraying. And uh, I threw up the uh, chart that uh, uh, Kim has shown us a few times uh, regarding uh, critical weed-free periods for for crops. And you know, you wouldn't think. Uh, you know, if you go on your field and you don't see a lot of big weeds right now, you wouldn't think the damage that they, they are doing or what they could be doing to your this year's crop. And when you look at spring wheat, you know, your critical uh, weed free period is one to three leaf stage. So for this producer here, you know, this is a critical time for him to make sure that there's uh, 
uh, not a lot of weeds there and uh, he did get his burn off done so that that was good but I guess uh, that's just uh, kind of the warning is to make sure you try to get your burn off done so you're not in a situation where you've got wheat that's uh, coming through the ground like this where you can no longer do a burn off and uh, you're still uh, you know a fair bit of time away from doing uh, in crop weed control so uh, uh, at this point, you would get a lot of big weeds that would uh, definitely cause some problems. With uh, canola, you're looking at, again, two to four to six leaf stage. So again, uh, you know, you got a little bit more grace with canola, but again, uh, uh, just uh, showing where the early weed control is important and uh, it just helps that crop get off to a good, healthy and vigorous start and not have any uh, competition for moisture or 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 sunlight even because sometimes you get uh, some wheat uh, populations that are fairly thick and I am seeing a lot of volunteer canola uh, germinating and coming through right now so if you uh, are in fields where you're sowing wheat down to canola stubble definitely uh, keep an eye out for you know, the volunteer canola that's coming because uh, it can uh, come up fast and then uh, also uh, cover the ground fairly fast uh, as it gets going and and weather conditions are definitely favorable for that. So uh, when we look at our uh, crop yield response to seeding dates and uh, looking at the third week of, uh, of May, uh, we are getting to the, to the point where we may start losing some of our, uh, our uh, yield uh, to, uh, to seeding dates. And you can pick out a few of them that uh, definitely need to be uh, taken care of. And uh, when you look at something like field peas, uh, you know, you're down into that, uh, you know, mid 80s to mid, <clears throat> mid 90s right now for, uh, for yield uh, response for seeding at this time of year. Now, depends a bit on our growing season, but uh, this is just some average, uh, average information. If we get good growing conditions and we don't get a lot of heat, you could definitely still see those crops hitting 100%, but kind of just a little bit of a warning that, you know, some of the crops that definitely need to be uh, looked at getting in the ground fairly quick here. And the other one that uh, uh, kind of jumped out at me a bit was, uh, was oats. I seen the oats one where we're starting to drop below that as well. So I think, uh, definitely need to, um, uh, if you're planting oats this year, uh, in order to maximize yields and, and, you know, like the, the yields where guys have been getting, you know, a hundred plus, uh, bushels an acre in order to get those type of yields, we need to get that crop in fairly early. So, uh, uh, don't hold back on, on getting your oats in the ground right now. That's for sure. Just a couple maps as to where we sit, uh, and these maps are going to uh, are usually produce weekly for our, on our crop report. And this is going to be the percent of normal precipitation from May 1st to the 14th. So you see when you look at the province, uh, we are uh, we are getting kind of uh, kind of dry. And I think uh, that's in the back of a lot of producers minds right now. Uh, we haven't seen a lot of rain. Uh, I know talking to uh, Lori, before we got going today, uh, up in the, up in the paw, it's uh, it's dry up there. She mentioned, uh, you know, you look across the west rest of the province, where you know anywhere between, you know, sixty or fifty and sixty percent of normal precipitation for this time of year, except for uh, a couple areas. Uh, you look at uh, the Melita Pearson area down in the southwest corner. Uh, you know, they're, uh, you know, and they got a couple of those showers that went through that I mentioned earlier on uh, at the uh, along the borderline there where uh, they had brought them up to, you know, 100% of normal or, or pretty, pretty much uh, right on track to being, uh, you know, where you'd like to be for this time of year. So a uh, rain is definitely something that would be nice uh, and uh, uh, not something that would keep us out of the field for two or three days, but something that would uh, just... Uh, uh, give uh, give a little bit of a soaking so we can get keep that crop that crop growing. Um, the soil moisture uh, this is uh, something that uh, uh, and I think we can see this as we're seeding in the fields. Uh, a lot of producers are seeding into, as I mentioned, pretty much you know good seeding conditions, good soil moisture, and so when you look at where we are across the 
across the province from zero to 30 centimeters where uh, we're, uh, we're actually in, in good condition right now. Um, and uh, the good part I mentioned before is that it's not, it hasn't been super hot yet. So we, uh, we're not drying it out too much when we're putting the crop in. So uh, I think uh, right now that's, that's helping us out. Uh, you know, some of the later snowfalls and uh, maybe some moisture from last fall is definitely uh, helping us out right now to, to get, uh, to be able to seed into moisture and hopefully get that crop up and, 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 and growing. So with that, that's uh, a bit of the uh, the update uh, that I had prepared so far for today. Uh, now we're going to go into the crop scouting panel and uh, uh, a couple of questions that have been have come up. And uh, I guess one of the first ones I wanted to uh, talk about or we wanted to talk about today was uh, the announcement of the, uh, and this is a tough one to say, uh, Lambda Clythorin. Uh, and uh, and it's uh, not to, basically the use of it has been canceled as of April 23rd. And uh, I thought it'd be a good opportunity to get John Gavlowski to come on and maybe just talk about how this might impact producers, uh, what we need to watch for uh, if we are using any of these products that we might still have in the shed. And so, John, uh, if you would like to take over and maybe give us an update on that. Okay, I'm just going to pull up a PowerPoint show real quickly here. You bet. Yeah, just share your screen. Have a few things uh, planned. Can you see my show, Lionel? Yeah, if just go uh, full screen and we'll be good. Perfect. Okay, cool. Okay, so um, as Lionel mentioned- I'm just gonna oh, interrupt you for just a quick second, John. Can you go up to the uh, top where it says display settings on your screen? We're looking at your, um, yeah, and just swap. Oh, swap, swap. right, you okay, bet. there we go. Okay. There you go, Perfect. beautiful. Okay, um, so yes, as Lionel mentioned, I'll, I'll be providing an update on a couple insecticides. Uh, the first one, uh, Lambda Cyhalothrin, there's been some what we call label amendments. The product isn't being phased out, but the label has been amended. Um, so what has changed, uh, there's been a few crops that were removed from the label and those include sunflowers, pastures, um, and then some vegetable crops, bulb, vegetables, lettuce. So really what affects farmers in Manitoba is the sunflowers and pastures part to that. So. Uh, it, it can't be used anymore for uh, seed head insects and sunflowers or um, in pastures for grasshoppers. Now, the other uses, um, small grains, canola, corn, flax, most of our other field crops, things are still registered at the same rates. Um, the, the one thing that has changed, a restriction has been placed on um, all those uses. The crop can't be used as animal feed. So that means if you spray the product on your canola or your wheat, uh, the grain can be used if it's going into the human consumption market, but you can't be selling any part of that plant for animal feed. So if it was canola, uh, it can get crushed for the oil, but the meal can't go as animal feed. So if you were to use um, any of these products on canola, you would have to ensure that uh, the, the canola meal isn't going into the animal feed market. Now, with these uh, label amendments, uh, companies have been reevaluating um, their marketing plans for the products. Uh, Syngenta decided that for this year at least, for 2023, uh, Matador and Volume Express won't be available in Western Canada. Uh, the other uh, uh, industries marketing these products, they will have, so, so Silencer, La Bamba, and a new one, Zavada, will be available this year. So you, you can get these, you can uh, use them on uh, the registered crops, but you do have to ensure that the end product is not going as animal feed. So that's the, uh, the change to the labeling with these products. 
Now, a product that is being phased out is chlorpyrifos. So that's your Lorsban, Pyrinex, Nufos, Citadel. There's several names that that goes by. Um, and that has been, um, the, the phase out actually started a couple of years ago with this product. It was kind of a three stage process. And as of December of 2022, um, any product that uh, retailers had had to be sold. Retailers are not allowed to sell these products anymore as of December 2022. So you can't buy these products anymore. Now, should you have some Loris Ban or Pyrenex or something already on your farm, you can use it up until December 2023. So you've got this growing season to use up existing stock, but you won't be able to buy new supplies of this product. And after December this year, then it's totally phased out. It, uh, essentially at that point, it's um, uh, waste that you need to dispose of at one of the clean farm events or something. But uh, you have this year to use up any existing supplies. Now where um, this uh, Lorsban in particular, Lorsban, Pyrenex, some of these products were used is um, in areas where wheat midge was an issue uh, Clopyrifos really was the go-to product. Now, fortunately, we haven't been doing a lot of spraying for wheat midge in Manitoba. Uh, further west, there's some pockets, some areas where they're kind of almost locked into a spray cycle for wheat midge. Uh, here, it seems to be more a sporadic thing, but Clopyrifos was the product of choice because it did kill the egg and um, the adults, whereas the only alternative left is dimethoate, which kills the adults, but not the eggs. So if you are able to get some, if you do need to spray for wheat midge and you can get dimethoate, um, you want to get that on as quickly as you know that you're above threshold because it's not killing eggs. Now, another alternative, if you're in an area that has had some wheat midge pressure in recent years, uh, if you've had any downgrading, there's a lot of midge tolerant varieties on the market now uh, and in many different classes as well. So th this is another good alternative. When the midge tolerant varieties first came out, the concern was that some of the other traits and characteristics and yield potential uh, weren't as good as some other varieties, but that's really no longer the case. There's so many varieties out there now and they've got good yield potential. Uh, if you're looking for a short straw or um, straw strength or some disease resistance, um, you'll probably, be, especially if you're in this um, the CWRS grouping, you can probably find something that has the midge tolerance and meets your other needs. So the midge tolerant wheat varieties would be another way to go if you're concerned about wheat midge with the chlorpyrifos phase out, because again, you're options chemically are now getting pretty slim. And just uh, maybe to, to wrap up my insecticide update, um, new insecticide. So we are losing some, but we're also gaining some. And in this case, what we're gaining is something that is uh, a selective product to um, insects that are sap feeders, in this case, aphids, and to some degree, ligus bugs. And the product is called Carbine. It's a, um, a product, this will be its first year on the market in the Canadian prairies. Uh, there was a, a, um, a version called Belief, which has the same active ingredient. Um, Carbine is more the field crop version of Belief. So it'll be priced a bit uh, differently than um, Belief. And um, this might be a good option if you have aphids in peas or faba beans. Um, what's nice about it is it, it disrupts the feeding behavior of the insect of the aphids. The aphids die, but it has a very low impact on most of our beneficial insects. So if you've got pollinators, uh, honeybees uh, out in the area, uh, or if you're concerned because you've you're seeing a lot of lady beetles or lace wings, but the aphids are above threshold. Uh, this will at least uh, be easy on the beneficials, but kill the aphids. So uh, might be something to consider if you're uh, needing to target aphids and peas later in the season. 
And in Lionel's uh, intro, he showed a picture of a cutworm, and I believe that was a picture from the Southwest from this year. And the original question that came with that was, um, is this early for this time of year? So it was a cutworm that was already fairly well advanced. And the question was, is it a bit early to be seeing cutworms that big? And the short answer is no, it's not because of the species that it was. Uh, what, what the cutworm in that photo was a dingy cutworm. And the reason it was easy to tell it was a dingy cutworm because they have what looked like a series of tire tracks running down the back of their body. There's this almost like little V's or tire tracks that run up and down the back of their body and kind of a, a, a grayish, um, a tan grayish color to them with the tire tracks. That's dingy cutworm. They overwinter as partially grown larvae. So you do see noticeable, they're at least a noticeable size this time of year. Whereas our redback cutworm, they belong to a, a group that tends to overwinter as eggs. So right now, redback cutworm would be really small. And you'd have to really dig and look hard to be able to see redback cutworm. Um, whereas the dingy, they're, they're a bit of a bigger cutworm right now, easier to see. Now, when we deal with cutworms, uh, cutworms are not all the same. And as entomologists, we tend to classify them into three groups. We've got a group we call the above ground cutworms, climbing cutworms, and then our subterranean, meaning below ground cutworms. So our above ground group, that's, that includes your redback cutworm and dark sided cutworm and a few others that we could get. Um, maybe very, very periodically, army cutworm would be in this group. So this group, um, what they do is they feed at surface level, basically. So when the plants are up and growing, um, especially when they're older larvae, they're very prone to be cutting the plants. Again, they're feeding right at the surface. They're not really climbing the plants. And so they do a lot of clipping. So next morning, you see clipped plants lying on the soil. Um, and there's a telltale sign that cutworms have been doing their feeding in the field. The group we call climbing cutworms, they don't do a lot of this clipping. They will climb the plants and feed on the plants. So instead of seeing clipped plants on the soil, all you see is defoliation on the plants if you're scouting during the day. Cutworms in general are nocturnal, so they're hiding in the soil or under trash or debris during the day. So when you're out crop scouting, if it's a climbing cutworm like dingy cutworm, you will see notches and leaves and the foliation, but not necessarily a lot of clipped plants. And during the day, you would have to dig around some of those damaged plants to find the cutworm. And uh, now above ground and climbing cutworms, you can kill with insecticides fairly easily because they're coming above ground to feed. This third group is really tricky. The pale western cutworms, um, or sorry, the subterranean cutworms, pale western being an example. Subterranean cutworms do not come above the soil much, so they're much trickier to kill. The good thing is majority of our cutworms that we deal with in Manitoba belong to the above ground or climbing group. Subterranean, the pale western cutworm, it's more of a dry land species. It's more prevalent in Western Saskatchewan, Eastern Alberta. That's where they have real problems with pale Western cutworm at times. It's an oddity here. We might get the odd field, the odd year that has some, but um, we, uh, ma vast majority of our cutworm issues here are red-backed and dingy cutworm in recent years. And we do find a, a little bit of some of the other species as well, but uh, these have been the dominant species in recent years. And I'll just wrap up by mentioning, uh, we do have diamondback moth traps up across the province. Uh, we're expecting about 100 traps up this year. And in the upper left, you'll see this uh, white uh, triangular shaped trap. We call them delta traps. And what we do is we stick a little um, lure in there and the lure has the same scent that the female releases at mating time. And so this scent draws the males into the trap and then there's a sticky bottom that the, um, the moths and other stuff get stuck on. And we just count diamondback moth on these traps weekly. And the whole purpose of this is if by chance we get a big population blowing in from the south, 
Um, hopefully the traps will pick them up and we can give you a bit of a heads up. And uh, traps started to go up at the very beginning of May. Uh, roughly about a third of our traps have been reporting data so far. Uh, a lot of traps are still into their first week. But so far of the 33 traps that have been reporting so far, um, we've had no diamond, uh, diamondback moth caught in the western part of the province so far. So that's good news. Um, we've got just a sprinkling of moth caught in the eastern central part of the province and the interlake. But again, these counts are really low. Our highest count right now is seven at Whitemouth. So um, that's really not much to worry over. So uh, we'll keep you posted. We'll be posting the data weekly on our website. And next week, we'll be starting up our Manitoba crop pest updates. And I'll be um, updating the data weekly in those updates as well. So maybe I'll wrap up with that line off. If there's any questions, I can take them. So do we have questions, Lionel or Laurie? Uh, I don't see any Lionel. Sorry, uh, sorry John. Yeah, I had myself on mute there. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, one question that came through uh, here was, uh, this is the, the, and actually this came from the producer that uh, sent me the picture of the, that's the, the dingy uh, cutworm that you were talking about. And uh, so, uh, the producer has matador in his shed. Well, first of all, will matador do anything to cutworms? Matador definitely will work on cutworms. Um, but he won't be able to use it, right? But the tricky part is, uh, yeah, you'd uh, you'd have to make sure that the wheat is, the, the grain isn't, like you, you can harvest the grain, but you can't use anything for animal feed. If by chance you had a bad year and you weren't able to market it as um, uh, a good quality grain and it was going to, you, you don't have that option of it going to animal feed right. if you use okay. Matador. That's the risk. So it, it doesn't matter uh, with the restrictions regarding stage of the crop. It's basically, it's, you know, the wheat is, you know, one leaf stage or, or right now are coming up and you still could not use matador on it that's the way yes that's the way it is right now um it, it, it's not stage specific okay okay yeah so that was the question he had so basically with uh, anybody with um, that type of product in the shed you're almost don't have a use for it anymore then right Unfortunately, that is the case, yes. Okay. Okay, uh, one other question that came in is, uh, with warmer conditions, can we expect an earlier emergence of grasshoppers? I'm going to say yes. And the reason, uh, there was a little bit of uh, rumbling uh, yesterday on the uh, Canola Watch call about grasshoppers, and I was a little skeptical. It seems a bit early for us to be seeing pest species of grasshoppers. So my uh, summer student and I went out yesterday and did a little bit of poking around. And uh, now we did find there there are some species that are non-pest species that tend to be uh, bigger this time of year, and we did find um, them. But we did also find just a few. Um, I've got them in the freezer and I'm going to be verifying the identification, but they looked very much like uh, first instar two stripe grasshopper nymphs. So that's one of our pest species. Uh, it looks like they probably just emerged in the past few days and we had to do a lot of looking to find a few. So, but it does appear that possibly some of the hatch has started, which is early. Um, usually I suggest that last week in May and early June for when grasshoppers start should hatch. Uh, um, sorry, grasshopper hatch should start. Um, so yeah, it's, it's a little bit on the early side and I, uh, things seem to be just starting to come out. Okay, yeah, that's, uh, I was talking to a couple of people that were moving some cattle around and they said that they were starting to see some, in ditches, they were starting to see some grasshoppers moving. Now, again, I didn't know what 
what um, variety they were, but uh, you know, it'd be interesting to see if there there are the we'd like you're talking. Yeah. Now, um, anything that is a potential pest species right now will be just a few millimeters. It'll they will be tiny. If you are seeing anything bigger than that, we saw one yesterday that was um, a good half inch or more, and that's one of our our um, you know, grass feeding pasture species. Um, if you're seeing anything that size, say any more than a few millimeters long right now, is probably one of our non-pest species. Okay, so uh, I, back to controlling then, like uh, you said, like a lot of like products to, for spraying on pasture. Will we have something that can be used for grasshopper control on pastures? So what, um, yeah, we, we do. Um, there's, there's actually quite a few things. And there's other pyrethroids too, not just um, the uh, Lambda Sihelothrin. So you've got desis and things like that that can work. Um, and actually, if you in our guide to crop protection, we, we've got a um, uh, insect management chart specifically for grasshoppers on pastures, rangeland, and roadside. And uh, I mean, one option is the, the eco brand, the brand bait that can be used. But aside from that, uh, Corrigen, Corrigen Max, uh, they can be used on pastures. And it's got quite a long residual, but it does cost a bit more than some of your pyrethroids. Uh, I know people have experimented with applying that in strips. Instead of spraying the whole pasture, you apply it in strips, and you can get good control doing that because grasshoppers move around. So, more expensive product on pasture uh, application technique like that might be um, useful. But as mentioned, things like desis are registered on pastures. Um, uh, seven is there's a few other products that people can use uh, should they need to. Okay. And then just a question for me is with uh, with this change, are we going to be seeing uh, uh, maybe a shortage in some of the desis and sevens, or is there a fair bit of product out there? Uh, apparently, the companies are aware and they're uh, gearing up for this. Now, a lot does depend on what happens this season too. If we get some, um, I'll say, unexpected uh, insect issues, uh, that could change things. Um, uh, hopefully we'll get a good quick germination and quick early growth with our uh, canola because some years the flea beetle spraying uses up a lot of product. Mm -hmm. So we'll just keep our fingers crossed that uh, we don't have a lot of spraying some of those early season pests and things will be available if we do need it later. Okay, great. Well, thanks for doing that, John. It's a good update. Okay, thanks. Okay, so uh, next question is for Anne, and it's regarding seed treatment. I was talking to a producer and he was saying because of the good conditions and the warm soil, he was wondering if he still needs to be treating all his cereal seeds. So uh, uh, Anne, if you wanted to maybe address that one. Sure, uh, thanks, Leno. Yeah, I think that um, when considering whether or not you should be treating seed at this point in time, because the soils are pretty warm, and we do expect germination to be pretty quick with these warm soils. So definitely less of a risk in general. Um, I think it's important just to consider your, your general risk factors um, when considering a seed treatment. So um, like, is your seed disease free? Is it certified seed? Um, have there been issues with that particular field before, like with seedling rod or blight? Um, and also crop rotation, like you have a tight cereal rotation where you would be at higher risk of disease. Uh, so if you do have a lot of risk factors, even with these warm soil conditions, then you would still want to consider putting a seed treatment on. But I think if you don't have those risk factors and um, the soil conditions are fairly warm and your seed bed's good and conditions are good for seeding, then uh, it would be less risky than to not apply a seed treatment. So I think just considering the risk factors that you have for some of those seedling diseases um, is how you should be making that decision. Yeah, and um, what what does a approximately cost to treat seed? <laughs> That's a good question that I'm not sure on the top of my head. Mm -hmm. 
<laughs> yeah, I know the question just came into my head. I was wondering if, you know, because maybe the cost isn't that much that uh, it's probably with the price of grain, it's maybe worth the, uh, worth the, uh, um, the treating just to get a healthier plant going. And... Yeah, like the, the price of seed is, is so expensive right now that I'm just assuming that the seed cost of seed treatment would also have gone up um, similarly. But but yeah, I think if, if you don't have those risk factors, like you have a good crop rotation, you haven't had issues on that field before, and your seed doesn't have disease, like it's a clean seed, then your risk of having, um, you know, any issues with seed rot or seedling blight are fairly low. Okay, good. Thanks, Anne. Uh, next question for uh, Dennis regarding uh, seeding depth for soybeans and uh, just a question about what might be our best best location to put the seed. And I think Dennis might have a few comments regarding uh, several factors to think about, I guess, as you uh, look at soybean seeding and we're getting into soybean seeding. So Dennis. Yeah, thanks, Lionel. Um, every year is a little different when it comes to seeding depth uh, for soybeans. Uh, kind of the optimal is between that, you know, inch, uh, three quarters of an inch to about inch and a half to inch and three quarters. Um, usually, if you have to go a little deeper into that inch and three quarter range, that usually means you're it's pretty dry spring. Uh, this year, though, we've had some pretty good moisture, um, and uh, growers are able to put it into that inch and a quarter range, kind of in the middle of that target range. Um, a few things to consider. The reason we don't like to go shallow is um, even though you might be expecting a rain, let's say if you go too shallow, let's say in that half inch rain range, what can happen is there might be enough moisture for that seed to germinate. But if you don't get rain, then uh, the seed tends to desiccate off and dry and, and, uh, and may die off. So that's not typically what we like to see. We like to see it go into moisture. Uh, on the other end of it, there's been years where I get a lot of questions on growers planting um, soybeans and wanting to go down to two inches. And, um, you know, two inches is fairly deep. And uh, they're doing that because of the moisture issue or lack thereof. Um, the problem there is if the soil is very cold, it takes a while for those beans to come up. So ideally, be in that three quarter of an inch to, you know, inch and three quarter range at, at the most. But uh, usually I like to put mine in somewhere around that inch and a quarter range. And that way we know we're into good moisture. So, Okay, good, uh, Dennis. Um, got one more question for you, but one just came in for John uh, Gawoski. John, so maybe I'll just ask it right now. Uh, the question was, um, why are the insecticides uh, not good for animal consumption, but they are okay for human consumption? That's a tricky question, and, and um, so I think what happened is just to give you a bit of background on this. Um, I know there were issues where um, lamb, the cyhalothrin, was found in milk, and um, in some animal products, and so. I think that's what was contributing to the uh, the, um, the decision that was made. Anyway, there the product was being re reviewed. Anyway, uh, all the uh, pesticides have to be reviewed on a cyclical basis. But um, having had residue found, um, not, not just in animal feed, but in animal products. Um, I think that was partially what uh, factored in. Um, I don't know that, that they had grounds to um, remove uh, uses for human consumption, but I, I appreciate the question because it does seem a bit of a disconnect that uh, we can crush the seed and eat the oil as humans, but the feed can't go to animals. Um, so I, I don't know that I've really answered the question, but I think it is because of um, the uh, residues being found in animal products that their review went the way it did. Okay, yeah, I would imagine it's it's fairly complicated, but that's uh, yes, yeah, makes makes sense what you're saying, but also the the question about 
you know, canola oil and not being able to use canola meal is kind of a confusing one, but. Uh, it, 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 I agree, it's, it's very confusing. And yeah. it, in, in some ways people will look at and say, this doesn't make a lot of sense. And uh, I, I agree, it, it is very confusing the way, uh, the way the amendments are currently. Okay, good, thanks, John. Uh, Dennis, uh, seeding is happening fast and crops are emerging quick. Uh, some tips on rolling peas, timing, staging, things to watch for. I think some guys are getting caught and not getting to the field quick enough here so uh, to do it before emergence. So any comments on that? Yeah, so uh, if you're looking at uh, rolling, ideally uh, uh, for peas or soybeans, you wanna be rolling uh, if soil conditions are good right after seeding. Um, but if soil conditions are not, or if the crop emerges before you come up, in the case of peas, um, you would be wanting to wait till that second node stage just to get the plants all out of the ground. And what's key there is you want to roll them on a nice warm, warm day. So 20, above 25 degrees, don't roll them in the morning. Um, and uh, that's what you're kind of looking for. If, uh, uh, so good warm day, 25 degrees. And... Um, and in the afternoon. That's the one thing that some growers tend to uh, get a little anxious with because you might have a warm, warm morning, but you want the plants to be nice and pliable. So waiting till the afternoon till the, uh, uh, till the uh, plants warm up a, bit, up a bit. And starting at that second node stage, second to third node stage is kind of ideal where you want to be in there. Okay, and uh, going too early? Um, I, I think, with peas, it's a little different just because their uh, their um, growing point, um, like their scale nodes, are kind of below the surface. So if you break a plant, they tend to regrow where soybeans don't do that. But um, I generally, once they start poking up, I'd rather see somebody wait a little bit and roll afterwards just to make sure you get a nice good stand there. And they they're pretty pliable. Um, I've seen growers roll on a good warm day, and uh, you know a few hours later, you can't even tell they're rolled. Okay, good point, Dennis. Uh, Marla, question for you. I had a producer that called and said uh, they uh, sewed an entire air tank with uh, the nitrogen uh, tank lid uh, not closed properly. So just didn't have any pressure in the tank. So they basically seeded in 120 acres and they weren't putting any nitrogen down with uh, as they were seeding. So he was wondering what his options were for getting the nitrogen on those uh those acres now he didn't yeah, so, want to go and reseed the whole field or 120 acres again to dry yeah, it out. See, okay yeah and he um they can if they can uh go on and get uh some fertilizer broadcast or dribbled on um they could go in and do that now on that 120 acres uh i mean obviously if you're using any urea based product you want to keep in mind that if we're putting it now on the surface and we don't have a good solid rain you know up to half inch coming um, then you want to make sure that you've protected it with a urease inhibitor so an mbpt something like that um, if uh if timing is such they have to wait a little bit to be able to get that fertilizer on um, they could have some success with dribble banding or um, broadcasting um, urea, say up to like stem elongation. Um, application can go up to heading, but you wouldn't want to go any later than that. And if you're trying to get, you know, the best performance out of it and best plant uptake, then stem elongation would probably be okay uh, that way. But uh, the trick with waiting that long, though, if you are going to be, um, you know, dribble banding or broadcasting uh, again that urea product or a nitrogen product later on in the summer as that crop is growing. If that soil surface is dry and there's not a lot of moisture or rain at that time, it can threaten to basically leave that nitrogen a bit stranded at the surface and the plant can't access it. So it might be best interest to, to get it on a little sooner rather than later. But again, if there's not going to be that solid rain in the in the forecast, then um, get it on with uh, with some kind of protection uh, of a urease inhibitor. Okay, and how long? The question was uh, so. How long will the inhibitor last? Let's say he puts it on today, and we don't get a rain for a week and a half. Yeah. 
those inhibitors are usually giving you like you can you can expect to get you know seven to nine seven to ten days of performance out of them so they're just buying you a little extra time i mean the alternative without it is you have to put more urea on in order to uh afford to lose some of it say um, but if you don't want to have to up your rate in order to have to lose uh, some of that urea, then you're putting that in, getting that insurance on, and it's going to buy you that seven to, to 10 days of time. And with the uh, hot, dry, or the hot and windy conditions, or warm, windy conditions, I should say, mm -hmm. right now, I probably wouldn't take long for striped nitrogen to start losing it. Yeah, so if you, yeah, exactly. If you're putting an unprotected product on again, yeah, we, with those hot, dry, windy conditions, that's your kind of highest risk of that ammonia volatilization to be happening. So again, if, if you don't have that guarantee of having some good rain in that forecast, then if you're going to be broadcasting, it makes best sense to, to get it protected. And we were seeing that driving out to, to Carmen this morning, um, that there are some people that are floating on nitrogen, but you could tell as they were loading it in the tank, it had that lovely color of uh, being uh, protected with agritane. So I think people are, are recognizing that there's some importance to making sure that if you're going to be broadcasting right now, you want to make sure that you've got that urease inhibitor on it. Okay, great. Thanks, Marla. Kim. Uh couple of weeds uh, pictures have come in and I thought maybe I'd get you to uh, talk about them and identify them and maybe we can uh, lead into our weed seeding ID I, uh, day coming up. Okay, hey, thanks Lionel. The one in the square, I think that's just a stinkweed. Um, it's pretty little, we can see some kochia right above it. And I think there's a round leaf mallow off to the side. You can kind of see that poking out a bit, but that's just stinkweed. And honestly, for me, I don't see that as a driver weed. We see a lot of stinkweed um, uh, that overwinters. It's either a winter annual or a spring annual. And when it overwinters, there's no point kind of going after it. It, it, it flowers and, and sets seed very, very quickly. And once plants turn, or once weeds turn vegetative or uh, reproductive from vegetative, they're really hard to kill. So um, the spring ones, you know, you, you a lot of the sprays um, will do a really good job on stinkweed. Um, some of the bigger winter annuals, if you're not going to get at them right now, um, they're going to be too late. And it's just kind of more re revenge spraying when we see those big ones that we want to spray. Um, but those tend to be more field edges and kind of waste areas or areas where there's lots of high nitrogen and stuff like maybe there's been manure spread or Lots of lots of times we see stinkweed around yard sites and things like that where there's been historically been manure. Uh, the one on the right hand side there, I think that's probably like a night flower and catch fly, possibly a white cockle, depends where you are. There's lots of white cockle in pockets. Saw, saw a lot of that up in the Swan River area. So those actually are opposite leaves. It doesn't look like it right now, um, but I'm pretty sure that if you if you pull those out, um, so those are overwintering as well. That's acting that's by the by that size, that's a winter annual because um, that's just too big to have germinated this spring. Even though we've had nice weather, that is just too big. So if you pull that up and I look at them upside down and I start peeling the leaves off um, starting like I guess when it's upside down starting from the top um, so starting from the very bottom of the root and if you actually start peeling the leaves off you can actually see that those leaves will be opposite each other um, you're starting to see it there in the top maybe four leaves you can see that they're opposite but it's hard to tell until you pull that up from the ground and peel those leaves away and you can see that they're opposite leaves because of the family that night fly and catch fly and white cockle and bladder campion and cow cockle and all that all that family is the pink family um, so very similar, same family as carnations. And so if you look at a carnation flower, uh, opposite leaves, and, uh, and that one's very easy to see because there's lots of stem in between. These ones, once the stem starts to elongate, you will see um, those, that opposite leaf trait on them. Um, that's very distinctive. It, they're opposite from, um, from the minute the plant emerges. Other weeds are um, opposite at the bottom and then alternate at the top. But um, this is one, everything in that family, um, like I said, the catch fly, night fly catch fly and the white cockle and that type of thing. And the cow cockle and um, the campions, they are uh, true opposite leaves. So that one too looks a bit hairy. Um, sometimes too, you'll see dandelion fluffies kind of stuck to it in the spring because our dandelions are going to seed. So, you know, if you're going to go after those ones, you've got to get after that one pretty quick. That's exactly where a pre-burn spray would do a great job um, because you've got, those are very big weeds. And um, by the time you get to around to in-crop spraying, that's going to be far too big and you're not going to get it. So that would be my, uh, my advice on that one. Great, Kim. Uh, I'm going to just go to the next slide here and maybe you want to make a couple 
uh, comments regarding the weed seeding ID day? Uh, yeah, so we are collaborating with ACC and Brandon again. They've got, uh, we started doing that last year. They've got a terrific weed garden. It's up kind of at the top of the hill by the, there's a red barn up there. So we're having um, a workshop on May 25th. That's a Thursday, uh, rain or shine, because we can do an inside part and then we can look at weeds in the rain if we have to. Um, and so we're starting at 9 a.m. There's going to be registration and coffee at that point. And then at 9.30, I'll give a presentation on weed ID, think weed families, things to watch for or you know, some of the terminology. Uh, so it's great for anybody who's green and just starting off or it could be just a good refresher for, you know, we haven't seen a lot of these weeds yet. Um, this year and we're always kind of scrambling to remember what they are um, and then at 10 30 once we're done the presentation and if there's any questions or whatever and then we'll head on up to the weed garden and like I said uh, ACC has just done a fantastic job at getting a weed garden started and they've got everything from annuals to biennials to perennials and kind of pretty much everything you can think of is up there. So uh, there is going to be CCA CEU credits available, which is great for all of us CCAs. And if you want to confirm your attendance, um, there's, a, um, uh, there's a, a, a website there that you can, or sorry, an email that you can contact somebody at. So, or, and like I said, registration is not required, not required, will be done by noon, or you're welcome to stay as long as you want in the weed garden, but uh, up to you. Uh, but registration again is not, not required. Great, thanks, Kim. Uh, Marla, uh, any comments regarding the uh, crop diagnostic school? Of course, absolutely. Um, so uh, uh, what you've got on your screen here for any farmers that are um, uh, listening to the call, um, we have Farmer Day for Crop Diagnostic School this year, Friday, July 7th. So if you are a farmer and you are a member of MCA, MPSG or MCGA, um, they are covering the cost so that it becomes complimentary registration. If you're a non-member, um, it is $75 for non-member farmers to attend. So that is our farmer day. Um, this is available. You can email mbcropschool at gmail.com. Uh, you can put farmer day in the subject line and then tell us your name, your farm name, and your memberships. Uh, to the three commodity associations. Um, we will double check the memberships for you. Sometimes people don't always know um, if they're a membership, a member of all three. So, um, and then we will register you for that. For agronomists who are listening, we're just putting together our registration uh, link. So registration is coming for the regular crop diagnostic school days for all the agronomists. That will be held on um, Wednesday and Thursday. July 5th and 6th, and then Tuesday through Thursday the following week, July 11th to 13th. So those will be the regular uh, registration days for agronomists. Uh, so right now we've got the farmer day moving, but then the agronomist day is coming. It's through a different registration process. Great. Thanks, Marla. Um, Anne, you've got some uh, uh, comments for the corn survey. Uh, you just go ahead. Thanks. Yeah, I just wanted to mention that uh, with Manitoba Agriculture and Manitoba Crop Alliance are going to be conducting a corn disease survey, both taking place in the spring, so mid-June and in the fall. Uh, so we're looking for fields and anyone that wants to participate. So if you um, have a field of corn that you'd like us to come survey and can give you, you know, all the information that we see, or if you know someone that has corn that you would like to be surveyed, please reach out to myself or Morgan Cott. Uh, and we would happily add you to the list. Okay, and that's was a disease survey? Yeah, it's a corn disease survey and we're doing it twice um, twice this year. So the spring survey is new just to assess, um, you know, any seedling diseases or uh, blights early on in the spring and then also look at later fall uh, diseases or corn issues. Great, okay, thanks, Anne. Uh, we talked about, uh, or John talked about today about insecticides that are going to be available to use in uh, controlling uh, uh, pests this summer. Uh, there's uh, a book to, to grab. This is the one that'll have all the information regarding what's what's available for you to use. Uh, also for weed control, that's coming up. So and then later on for fungicides for disease control. So uh, definitely a must get book and uh, it's available at all of the MASC service centers or if you're needing one, uh, contact uh, uh, an ag extension specialist. 
environmental farm plan is now uh, online, but is also uh, uh, we have some deadlines that are going to be coming up for uh, applying for programs. So if you haven't uh, looked at, into this yet, you should be looking into it and seeing what you can do to maybe access some funding for doing some projects on your farm. The crop production extension specialist, there's our contact information and our locations. Uh, our livestock people, again, the contact information and their locations. Our service centers, uh, so their numbers and where they're located. 1-800 number if you've got questions. And if you got questions from myself or Lori, uh, feel free to contact us anytime. And uh, if not, uh, join us next week, uh, May the 24th, as we uh, get more and more seeding done and more and more crop up and more and more things to talk about. So uh, thanks for attending and see you on May the 24th.